Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, today, of course, is the 2nd of August, and it's been almost a, uh, well over a year that we've had the vaccine rollout continue. And every day, I still hear from people who suffer from injuries from the vaccine or suffer through mandates or some form of discrimination. Uh, we've just recently passed about uh, through 10,000 cases of COVID in the last six months. Now, I don't know if that's not evidence to say that the vaccines aren't effective, then I don't know what is. However, I'm not here tonight to talk about the ineffectiveness of the vaccine, which didn't stop transmission. I'm here to talk about how unsafe the vaccines are. And I want to explain why, and I want to go through the biochemistry. Most vaccines, so for example, the COVID, uh, uh, COVID virus has 29 proteins in it. Normally, if you de-attenuated a vaccine, you gave someone a de-attenuated vaccine, you would take out the ionised molecule uh, of that virus. So you have got 20, 29 uh, molecules, you'll take out one. Uh, and what that does, and the one you'll take out is the ionised molecule. So an ion either has more electrons than protons or likewise more protons than electrons. Either way, it's a charge. And that's what they call the active ingredient in a vaccine. It's the thing, if you've got two magnets, one with the North Pole and one with the South Pole, goes past each other, it wants to attach. And that's why a vaccine normally is de-attenuated, because they take out that ionised molecule so it doesn't go around jumping on everything. But what that does is it allows the uh, antibody to attach to the antigen. End of story. Now, the other thing is, because that molecule is still quite large, it's 28 um, molecules remaining in a normal uh, de-attenuated vaccine, it is too big to cross the endothelium. Right? Now, what is the endothelium? It is the small capillary between your muscle tissues and your bloodstream. And in order to cross that uh, uh, capillary, you've got to be small enough in a process called uh, endocytosis in order to cross into the bloodstream. Right? Now, what this particular vaccine does is that delivers a lipid nanoparticle. It is a very tiny particle, much smaller by a factor of a thousand than a normal virus. And what that means is it can travel from the tissue through the endothelium into your bloodstream. Now, we know that that's the way this particular vaccine works because in the TGA non-clinical evaluation report, if you go to table 4.2, you will see where they have done the distribution of the lipid nanoparticles on, on the lab rats, literally the lab rats, uh, when they injected this particular vaccine. And I'll just read out some of, the, some of the body organs that it went through and the concentration increases. I just want to focus for a start on the ovaries. After the first 25 minutes, it was at 0 0.1. The, uh, uh, so the concentration levels was uh, milligrams to each gram. So by the end of the first uh, 25 minutes, it was 0 0.1. By the end of the first day, it was 0.5.25. Uh, and then by the end of the second day, it was 12.26. Now, that has doubled after two days, and that's, that's not the only organ. Uh, it went into the liver, uh, goes into the heart, the eyes, the brain, the bone marrow, the bladder, the adrenal glands. There's just about half of the vaccine and the lipid nanoparticles go into organs other than the injection site. Now, this is despite the fact that we were told that a normal vaccine goes into your deltoid muscle and that's where it stays. Well, that's not the case with this particular vaccine. And what's particularly scary about this is they knew this in the animal trials, and despite the fact that the concentration was still increasing after 48 hours, you know what they did? They stopped the trial. They stopped the trial. Now, don't you think you would run the trial right through to the point of where the lipid nanoparticles had left the body? But they didn't do that. And not only that, that's just the start of it, because once you start gets inside the cell and start uh, creating the spike protein, that can last for days longer as well. But here's the thing. In the animal trials, they never delivered the spike protein mRNA inside the lipid. They delivered a benign enzyme by the name of luciferase, which is the stuff you see in fly flies, uh, and that lights up so that they could trace it. But as the TGA non-clinical report says, they never tested the distribution and degradation of the spike protein in any humans or animals in this particular, uh, for this particular vaccine before they rolled it out. Now, 
Normally, when you get the virus, okay, it comes in through your mucosal system, uh, and, is get, and then if your muc in hemoglobin A in your mucosal system doesn't actually kill the virus, it'll eventually get in your systemic blood system. Your mucosal system is driven by hemoglobin A. Uh, your systemic blood system is driven by hemoglobin G. Now, once it gets in there, once the virus gets in, in order to get inside the cell, it needs to rely on the antigen, what they call the ACE receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme, and also the transmembrane serine protease, which is another enzyme. And that has to carry the virus across your cell membrane because your membrane is there to protect the organelles inside the cell, i.e., your nucleus, your ribosome, and your mitochondria, in particular, from the external forces. What this particular vaccine does, it's it uh, cat the, the lipid is catatonic. So that means it uses transfection and like you're cooking sausages uh, on, on the barbecue and you see blobs of fat merged together, that's exactly what happens with transfection. There is no uh, uh, barrier to this particular vaccine with the lipid going into any cell. So not only does it stop inside the, uh, at the deltoid, it goes all throughout your body and it can go into any cell because of the way they've designed this lipid protein. Lipid nanoparticles, sorry. Now, once it's actually inside the actual cell, okay. Normally, now this is this is a first, right? So normally, you know, you get a vaccine, you get the antigen, doesn't go anywhere near your cell. Once it goes into your cell, it then goes into the part of your cell called the ribosomes, which is which translates the mRNA. Now that ribosome will produce a protein. Now normally, the the spike protein in the, on the virus is not the same as the spike protein in the vaccine. No, no, what they've done is they've replaced the nucleotide uracil and they've put in a new uh, nucleotide called methyl pseudouridine. Now, that was shown in studies in 2005 to actually evade the in immune system and have greater self-amplifying properties. In other words, it creates more proteins. Uh, but not only did they modify the mRNA that way, they also added another 70 adene nucleotides at the end of the mRNA strand. Right, so normally there's about 30 adene nucleotides at the end of the mRNA strand. Well, they've added another 70. So what does that mean? That the spike protein lasts a lot longer inside your cell, creating a toxic substance or a toxic molecule that you know, is ionised uh, in an unregulated manner. And by an unregulated manner, what I mean by that is it relies on your immune system to kick in and come in and destroy your cells. Now, a normal vaccine doesn't do any of that. It stays inside your deltoid muscle, doesn't go anywhere because it's too big to travel. So what we've got now is a vaccine that has delivered a protein in an unregulated manner. That, so that, that's similar to a pathway of cancer where basically you get the unregulated reproduction of toxic molecules, and then it relies on your own body's immune system to attack your cells. Right? So we're requiring, you know, where you've got some, where you've got your own body attacking your own cells, you're now creating a pathway similar to acquired uh, immune deficiency syndrome, which, you know, if it goes wrong, you do not want your own body attacking your own cells. Okay. So your next step after that is effectively your concentration. So when it comes through your mucosal system, if you've got a strong, healthy immune system, the hemoglobin A in that immune system should stop it from getting into your bloodstream. When it's injected directly into your bloodstream, all you're getting is an IgG response. You are not getting an IgA response. So when they said early on that it was going to stop transmission, that was a blatant lie. And why was it? Because anyone that understands anything about immunology knows that you needed an hemoglobin A response to kill the actual virus in your mucosal system. Because if you don't kill it in your mucosal system, you can still transmit it, right? So now the, the paper did show that you got an hemoglobin G response, and that lasted for up to 35 days in rats, uh, sorry, in monkeys. But those monkeys only weighed 10 kilograms, and they gave three times the dose of what they did to humans. So it was a, a, a greater dose of about 20 times. So you could argue that, you know, 35 divided by 20 days, maybe the hemoglobin G response might have start, lasted for two days. But the other point is, is that by doing it this way, and what, what the pathways they are using was that they never tested this before they put it into humans. They never tested for genotoxicity studies, despite the fact that this was the first time they ever put genes inside a body and a synthesised genes. 
They never did longitudinal testing. They never did carcinogenic testing, and they never tested it for other drugs. So people who take other drugs, especially immunosuppressants, Thank they never tested it for much, that. Senator Rennick. Authorised G. Rennick, LMP Chermside.